The human race is fragile, and even its large structures like oil rigs and power stations can be vulnerable. Nature can unexpectedly visit catastrophic events upon the world, as happened at Fukushima. Such things are rare, and we learn from each one how to improve the resilience of our infrastructure. So what can robotics and autonomous systems research offer to help us deal with emergencies when they happen? Okay everyone, before we take you to look at the turbines, we're going to visit the control centre where you can see how we monitor the temperature, okay? Using increasing high fidelity computational models of the atmosphere and the ocean, meteorologists are now able to forecast the effect storms might have on coastal communities and installations. Nevertheless, freak tidal surges that elude the forecast models may still occur, especially when associated with earthquakes. As the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster has shown, effects on facilities like large power stations may be catastrophic. Real-time data coming in from sensors mounted on offshore data buoys lets the Met Office know the probability of any imminent storm surge. A response plan will swing into action with emergency services and operators of power stations in the affected area notified immediately. Then the duty manager in charge of the control room would order an evacuation of all non-essential personnel. But today, all is calm. Steam is normal inside a power station, as is the humming sound of turbines. Inside the boilers, a thousand tons of boiling water creates the steam to drive the turbines. Right, so we're in the main turbine hall now, and we've got a high pressure, intermediate, and three low pressure. Right, okay, this is another drill, guys, so I'm going to need you to leave through the door over here as quickly and as safely as you can. So follow me, please, and make sure they all follow out. The explosion has made parts of the building collapse and there is damage to the dock area which might lead to water flooding the lower levels of the facility. There is also a possibility that people may have been trapped. The smoke and steam will soon be spread far and wide by the wind. What does it carry? There is risk of contamination. Right, is everyone here? Yeah. One, oh, two, three, four, yeah. five, six, seven, eight, nine. nine. What about Lucy? Oh, don't worry about Lucy. Brian will evacuate her. Is there a safe way to rescue Lucy and the remainder of the workforce who might still be inside? Beyond the immediate disaster zone, the first priority for the authorities is to establish what the fallout is and how it is spreading across the region. This information is then used to draw up an evacuation plan, if necessary, for neighbouring communities. Rapid response is key. A large-scale atmospheric sensor network needs to be deployed and pressed into service quickly. Researchers at the University of Southampton have developed a sensor deployment system based on a large fleet of paper aeroplane scale aircraft. We use gas balloons to take these paper-based sensor-carrying aircraft uh, above the target area. We then release them and as they descend through the affected block of airspace, they take measurements which they send back using their onboard telemetry system to our central processing hub. We then use uh, computer modeling techniques to build a three-dimensional picture of the fallout. The data measured above the site and in its vicinity can be fed into the Met Office weather model, allowing forecasters to predict the path of the fallout cloud. University of Southampton researcher Kirk Martinez is an expert at coordinating signals from multiple autonomous sources. 
They come from the different sensors mounted on the various drones, robots and marine vessels under deployment. We're starting to build up a picture now of all the gases coming out and the cloud forming and we're getting data from some sensors. As we deploy more and we get data from the robots and subs, then we'll have a much better picture of what's happening. So we're launching the autonomous underwater vehicles and the autonomous surface vehicles into uh, the zone now. Uh, these, when combined with the aerial vehicles and all the combined sensors on board, will give us a good overview of what's occurring within the uh, danger zone. Uh, we're able to launch these from outside of the, uh, of the danger zone itself so that we, we ourselves remain in a, in a safer area. These sensors, multi-beam echo sounders, terrestrial laser scanners, are used on the surface water vehicle, uh, some of the submarine vehicles, to build 3D models of the infrastructure and the topography below the water surface. They're feeding back um, live feeds of data to the screens here and we can compare these with models of the infrastructure and topography that we have already to look for any discrepancies, um, i.e. any damage that might have occurred. We've also got the Teva drone up in the cloud feeding back live data of the contamination as well as the spotter unmanned aircraft which can stay up for long periods of time uh, also carrying a varied payload of sensors um, to measure the infrastructure and topography um, as well as levels of contamination. Deploying Argo Cat now, set to a perimeter sweep. The sensor on the Argo Cat allow it to roam around autonomously avoiding obstacles. It can relay live video along with thermal images which can be used to detect heat given off humans. It can safely go anywhere without endangering human life. The Ether tether drone system is providing an aerial viewpoint on the mission uh, from 100 metres above ground level without risking a manned helicopter. Uh, we can stay in the air for as long as possible to conduct the mission at barely 1% of a, of a price of a manned helicopter. As rescuers wait for the analysis of the smoke contamination, the comm centre receives confirmation from sensors on one of the AUVs already in the water that shows people in the sea. Lifeboats are needed. Is it safe to use a lifeboat? New data is coming in. It indicates that the level of toxic contamination will allow a rescue as long as protective clothing is worn and exposure is limited to 10 minutes. The information is relayed back to the control van and the position of those in the water is pinpointed so the lifeboat can go straight to where they are. Locating anyone left inside the power station is of paramount importance. The teams are working at top speed. It is too dangerous to go inside the building to search. We need to assess the safety of the area before we deploy our ground robots. Deploy Phoenix 1 and find some access points. Launching Phoenix 1. Lozen Bay 1 is open. We can deploy our robots through there. Deploying Goliath now. Goliath has a mast with cameras, infrared sensors, which helps us map the area and locate people. OK, the smoke is clearing. We can fly inside. Launching Phoenix 2. Phoenix 2 is an unmanned air vehicle equipped with high definition cameras and a depth sensor used to map the area and search for people. Phoenix 2 also carries Finder, a small, very agile robot that can go into confined spaces to reach things where Goliath and Phoenix 2 can't go. We have successful deployment, commencing autonomous inspection and search operation. This small robot is equipped with cameras and contamination sensors. Its size and agility allows it to move swiftly into the building to search for the missing people while at the same time building a 3D map of the inside of the damaged building. This is used by the robot to navigate and allows the first response team to plan their rescue operation using an accurate model of the debris and damage. The contamination sensors on board Goliath, the larger robot, provide a clear level of contamination to assess the safety of people in the danger zone. With the multi-sensor systems we're deploying, we're going to gather all the information from all the robots and sensors in order to build a big picture that we can use to steer where the robots need to go, for example. 
We have new thermal camera streams coming from the robots that were deployed on the ground and we can see two people moving through the building. I have located the missing personnel. I'll instruct them to follow Finder. There are many uses for robotic autonomous systems. Researchers are developing robots to work in dangerous environments like ocean oil and gas rigs. Robots like this can be sent anywhere in a dangerous environment like a drilling rig and the sensors they carry can inspect the structure in detail and detect even the minutest amount of gas in the atmosphere. They monitor our environment, for example, telling researchers how the condition of the ocean is changing in response to global warming. Metamorphic walking robots can operate in dangerous environments. An aquamav can collect water samples and environmental data from areas too dangerous for people to access. If there is a flooding situation of a toxic spill, or some toxic spill involved in a flood, it could fly there, dive into the water, take a sample and bring it back to the base station very quickly and much more quickly than a manned mission at also at much lower risk. Aquamav can do water sampling in dangerous flooding scenarios or as a toxic spill response. Robotic guiders can help people in low visibility. A robot arm pulls the person in a safe direction. The HiQ robot has software developed by Edinburgh University that allows it to walk on uneven ground, climb stairs and self-right as necessary. The building has now been evacuated and all personnel accounted for. Above us, Spotter is circling and researchers like Professor Jim Scanlon, who developed this autonomous aircraft, are monitoring the steady data stream. Spotter is an aircraft that we developed at the university which is capable of carrying a fairly significant payload. It can, for example, carry a chemical sensor pod to detect pollution or radioactivity. At the moment, Spotter is carrying a camera pod to provide live HD imagery. It has a very long endurance of over six hours, so can loiter in an area for long periods to provide monitoring. As machines like this are tested and used, so the inventors and researchers who develop them learn how to make them better, so that our world can be increasingly resilient to threats and increasingly effective at responding when disaster strikes. Spotter has been produced largely from 3D printed nylon following the technology demonstrator Salsa, which was the world's first 3D printed aircraft. It has been designed to be extremely reliable and robust. It has no single point of failure, including propulsion. Three months have passed. Now it is a question of constant monitoring, and every system has a job to do. This will go on for years, if necessary. The data collected feeds into the actions taken by local authorities and institutions that take care of population health. Such monitoring done night and day for years would be prohibitively expensive if we had to use manned equipment. And not only can we significantly reduce costs by using autonomous systems, the richness of the data we can gather and process enhances outcomes, allowing a faster recovery for people, land and infrastructure that's been affected. Through technologies like these, our resilience to natural disaster can become stronger, and that benefits us all. This was an imaginary scenario, but the robots are real, and they are there to help us.